You're listening to The Unsafe Bible with Pastor Ken Brown. God answers prayer. He answers yes, no, later. Never says maybe. I do not like no. I definitely do not like later. I like yes, right now. Ah, yeah, but I'll get to it. No, Lord, I need it now. He answers prayer. He is promising to do that for his people who are faithful. When you pray, do you expect an answer? Too often people pray as an exercise, but don't necessarily expect an answer. Today, Pastor Ken explains that God answers all your prayers. The answer could be yes, no, or not yet, but never maybe. The no's are hard to hear, but the not yet may be worse because if it's not now, when? Even if you don't like the answer God gives, he promises to answer as long as you're faithful to him. So from now on, when you pray, pray expectantly. Well, let's join Pastor Ken in the book of Isaiah, chapter 30, as he continues his message, This is the Way. As the new Jerusalem comes down, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He'll dwell with them, and they'll be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. That's what this is pointing to. That's where Isaiah is now pointing to. He's pointing to that future. When God's people pray for him to come and rescue them, he's going to do so. The first image of this is going to be coming very, very soon. Within about a year or so of of when he's writing this, the Assyrian army is going to be dealt with by Yahweh. But there's going to be one man who's going to go into the temple and and pray for salvation. He's going to be praying that, Lord, I don't know what to do. He's going to get an ultimatum. He's going to throw it on the throne, on the altar, and he's going to say, do something, God. I I, I can't do anything. That's Hezekiah. He's the one who's going to do that. The ultimate at the end of the age is when a regathered Israel, the remnant that remains, the one-third that we read about in Zechariah, all will individually pray for delivery. The army is there. They see the beast moving on them. There's no way they can protect themselves. They all go to their knees and say, Lord, save us. And he does. He does. Isaiah goes on to tell us the nature of the response. He will surely be gracious to you at the sound of your cry. When he hears it, he'll answer you. I mean, it's just that immediate. As soon as he hears it, he's there. So the second coming of Jesus Christ is an instantaneous response to save us. We don't understand how that's possible, especially since we're part of that group coming back with the Lord. We may have just spent a week getting ready and all of a sudden, they all as one say, that, say, Lord, save us, and we're there, just like that. I don't know how that happens, but the Lord does. It's a theme that Isaiah is going to repeat again. It relates to a single individual, the one who's born of a virgin, as we saw in Isaiah 7, 14. He's the shoot who springs from the stem of Jesse in Isaiah 11, 1 to 4. And he's the one who's come to judge the earth as well as rescue his people. That's in Isaiah 24. The emphasis, though, is upon God's graciousness. Isaiah uses here, in terms of language, an an infinitive absolute. Being gracious, he will be gracious to you. I mean, in other words, he's gracious, that's that's, that's just who he is. God is grace. God's gracious. And he's just going to respond in kind. The blessing is sure and firm. As soon as he hears, he answers, just that quickly. The verb is in the perfect, whereas the preceding verb was imperfect, meaning it's going to happen just like that. According to his hearing, it's done. It's just completed. It, it's, it's amazing because when he's here in person, it's, it, 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 everything changes. But the one thing we take from this is this. God answers prayer. He answers yes, no, later. Never says maybe. I do not like no. I definitely do not like later. I like yes, right now. Ah, uh, yeah, but I'll get to it. 
No, Lord, I need it now. He answers prayer. He is promising to do that for his people who are faithful. And he's saying at this time, the prayer is yes. And as soon as they pray it, it's answered just that fast. There's also prayer he will answer that unbelievers and unfaithful will pray. So he's talking about those who are faithful. But there's a prayer that someone who's an unbeliever or someone who has not been faithful, he will definitely answer and he'll do so immediately. It's the simple prayer, forgive me, Lord, I repent. That one he answers and he answers just like that. He will demonstrate his faithfulness in the very immediate future against the Assyrians. And in the far future, at the end of the age, against, as we learned another name for the beast, the Assyrian again. In the coming catastrophe of the destruction of Jerusalem and the coming exile to Babylon, he's going to be faithful to those who pray, even those who pray at that time. This is 150 years from when Isaiah is writing. But we see in Ezekiel chapter 9, again, God's faithfulness to those who pray. The glory of God, this is Ezekiel 9, the glory of God of Israel went up from the cherub where it had rested to the threshold of the temple. And there's this whole scene where the glory of God is departing from the temple and leaving. And he called to the man dressed in linen. So there's a man in linen with a, with a, cape, with a writing tool. And he tells this man who has the writing kit, and he says, the Lord said to him, go through the city of Jerusalem and put a mark on the foreheads of the people who moan and groan over all the abominations practiced in it. Let's put that in plain English. He's asking the man with the writing tool to put a mark on all of those who are praying for the city and that they would repent and come to him. He's protecting them. He's not going to protect everyone else, but he's protecting them. I think it would be interesting to find out how many of those people there actually were, who were who, and then they find themselves later in Babylon totally protected because God marked them. He saved them. He took care of them. That's also kind of a picture of what he's going to do with us as believers. He's going to take us out of here before he starts exercising judgment on the planet. He's marked us. We're his. We're out of here. The 144,000 are those who will be ministering for him during the tribulation. But what does he do in the book of Revelation? He marks each one of them, and they're protected all through the tribulation. That mark is a nice mark to have, I think. And as believers, we all have it. Here it is again, though. Those who pray and mourn over the sin around them are being protected. This promise of answered prayer is not just answered prayer in times of crisis. Many times, times of crisis bring us back to the Lord. They bring us back to, to prayer and to seeking Him. He would prefer for us to be walking with Him the whole time. And then the time of crisis is just an opportunity for us to grow in Him and become more like Him. But for many, it's the crisis that brings them back to the Lord and brings them back to prayer. That's what brought the prodigal son back. I'm starving to death. I'm taking care of pigs and I'm eating pig food. I'm going home. Uh, that made sense. But for those who are faithfully loyal to the Lord and seek Him for everything, there's something else that we see. Because, okay, if we're following the Lord and we're praying and we're seeking Him, what does Jesus tell us about the, our prayers? He says, ask and it'll be given to you. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Is there anyone among you who, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? No. Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? Well, no. Unless he asks for a snake, then I'll give him a snake. If you then, although you're evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? The problem is, is many of us don't ask because we don't pray. We don't talk to him. As we pray we realize we're talking to the God of the universe, okay? He can do anything. And we just need to rely completely and totally on him and trust that he can do that. James talks about that in James chapter 1. He just talked about it from the terms of if you need wisdom. If anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it'll be given to him. But then he adds this, let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that's driven and tossed by the wind. 
that person must not suppose he'll receive anything from the Lord. He's double-minded, unstable in all his ways. We need to pray in faith. As we're walking in the Spirit, walking, following our Lord, our prayers tend to conform more and more and more to what it is he wants to do. I find myself praying less for that Humvee that I've been desiring, to more for, Lord, just give me some transportation. Now, he may want to bless me with a Humvee, please, Lord, uh, but <laughs> probably won't, because that's what I would consume upon my lusts. He knows I like the car and I could drive it, but he doesn't. He, but it's not for, it's not in my best interest, because I'd probably do something stupid and drive into the Everglades with it or something like that. As we're walking in the Spirit, our prayers conform more and more to what it is He wants and what He wants to do. And because of that, the faith to believe Him for great things, that becomes easy because it's part of our relationship with Him and we're praying with what it is that we've already been talking to Him about. Lord, I really want to see this person saved. I want to see them come to You, Lord. I just pray that You would lead them to You, that they would become a believer. Or, or, Lord, open up the door for what it is that you want me to do to, to share you. Or you know, We find ourselves aligned with what the Spirit is doing. Lord, we, we really need to see our church continue to grow, and we want to see a new building. Well, there it is. It's right over there. God answers prayer. He really, really does. Remember what we just saw about the character of God in Isaiah 30, verse 18? He longs to be gracious to us. Here's the question. Do we allow him to do so? Sometimes the problem is, is that I get in the way. So we come to verse 20. Although the Lord has given you bread of privation and water of oppression, he, your teacher, will no longer hide himself, but your eyes will behold your teacher. So remember, we're, we're in the future. We're talking about after the tribulation is over with. This references to soon coming events, those which... Yeah, some of it's going to happen within a year or so. It's just the natural outcome of siege warfare in the 8th century B.C., and it's going to be continuing on for at least another several hundred years. They're going to experience things personally when the Assyrian army shows up. Now, the Assyrian army is going to be dealt with very quickly, but a hundred or so years further down the road, the Babylonians will show up, and they won't go away until half the nation is starved to death and the rest will go into captivity. And then there's going to be the Romans who are going to do it twice. And, and at the end of the age, the beast's going to do that too. Now, recovery? Yeah, there's going to be recovery upon the return. And we see the nation recover after coming back from Babylon. But that recovery has now taken an additional 2,000 years to take place. Okay? They're still not quite there yet. In the context of this verse, the bread of privation and the water of oppression are references to the hardships and afflictions that have been sustained by the people of Yahweh as a direct result of their faithlessness. Not their faithfulness, their faithlessness. God said, if you aren't faithful, this will happen to you. They weren't faithful, and it did. Looking back from Messiah, once they're at the end and, and Messiah has arrived and he's delivered his people, that's just all a memory. But it's not going to happen anymore in the future because from, from this point forward, he, your teacher, Messiah, will no longer hide himself. He wasn't hiding himself. They couldn't see him. They were blinded. But your eyes will behold your teacher. They'll see him. They'll see Messiah. And then what, what do we see happen? Well, again, Zechariah 12, 10, and he pours out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy. In other words, he's gracious to them. But there's still a realization, as it also says in Zechariah 12, 12, 10, that Messiah was here and they rejected him. And there's, oh, if we had only realized. And that's an impact that's going to hit those who are part of the remnant. They will see their teacher. And the realization of who he is will become a source of mourning as well as joy. They will have moved from the bread of privation to the bread of life. They will experience the reality of seeing their teacher with their own eyes. The self-imposed blindness is gone. Their teacher is no longer hidden. They can see him. Moses said this in Deuteronomy 29, verses 2 to 4. There was a 
a blindness problem even then. Moses proclaimed to all Israel as follows, You've seen all that the Lord did in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh, all his servants, and his land. Your eyes have seen the great judgments, those signs and mighty wonders. But to this very day, the Lord has not given you an understanding mind, perceptive eyes, or discerning ears. They saw it, but it never went in to the space between the two ears. They saw it happen, but they never understood what it was that they were seeing. Romans 11, 26, though, and so all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion and he will remove ungodliness from Jacob. That's what we're talking about here in verse 20. Verse 21, your ears will hear a word behind you. This is the way, walk in it, whenever you turn to the right or to the left. Faithful followers of Yahweh have an ongoing relationship with him. The scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God. It says that in James 2.23, and it was counted to him for righteousness. And guess what? He was called God's friend. Well, that's exciting. But did you know, if we're believers in Jesus Christ, we are all friends of him. John tells us in chapter 15, this is what Jesus says. In verse 14, he says, you're my friends. If you do what I command you, I do not call you servants anymore because a servant does not know what his master is doing. I've called you friends because I've made known to you everything I've heard from my father. We are friends with God. Stop and think about that for a minute. He's my friend. He's my father. I'm his adopted child. And I should be able to ask him for anything because he says he's going to give me good things. That changes my prayer life just thinking about that. We know this is the way because we know the one who is directing. The Lord's guidance to his people, he tells them the way they should go. And by saying that, this is the right way. That's the wrong way. Broad is the way to destruction. We know that. Narrow is the way to salvation. We know that too. Because of the relationship, because of the fact that they know the Lord and they hear his voice, it's going to be as easy as somebody walking up behind you and you immediately recognize the voice. You ever notice that when God told I, uh, Abraham not to sacrifice Isaac, he just said his name. Abraham immediately knew who it was who was talking to him. He said, yes, Lord. That's a relationship. He knew his voice. He knew what it sounded like. So when this relationship takes place at the end of the age, what he's telling his people is, it's just, just going to be like a shepherd walking up behind his flock. My sheep hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. I give them eternal life. So when he says, turn left, they're going to turn left. They'll never be lost. No one will snatch them out of my hand. What my father's given me is more important than anything else. No one can snatch them from my father's hand. So as we read God's word and we study what it is that he has for us, we hear him say, this is where this is what this is the direction you need to go. I, I go to this school or go to that. I mean, trust me, I spent a lot of time trying to figure out what school to go to. But once it became very clear, it was like the Holy Spirit saying, "That's the right decision. Go there." But I can't pay for it. My father won't agree to it. Don't worry about it. I got it all taken care of. And he did. He had it taken care of. And it was just as easy as you get to hear his voice. You get to learn what his voice sounds like. And the the closer we walk with him the more familiar that voice is and the easier it is to allow him to direct us. Verse 22, he says, as a result of the relationship, this is what Israel is going to do with their graven images. You will defile your graven images. Overlaid with silver, he's going into detail as to what happened to these. And that's not normally the case. Usually they just carve these gods out of wood or stone, but these are overlaid with silver. And molten images plated with gold, you'll scatter them as an impure thing and say to them, be gone. Let's unpack that a little bit. As the nation returned from Babylon, there was no longer an idolatry problem in Israel. It did not exist anymore. They never went back to idols. Never again would they run to false idols. Babylon took care of it. Seventy years along the, the beautiful Euphrates River, yeah, it was done. They, they, they solved the problem forever. But there's the emphasis here on the overlay of gold and silver. And that brings up the matter of a different God that is being followed. One which does not appear to the worshipers having anything to do with a fallen divine being, 
who we obviously knew were behind the earlier gods. The reality, though, is that the god of money is simply a veneer on top of those former gods. It's still the same thing. Jesus talked about it. Uh, he said to the, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, no one can serve two masters. You'll hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. And then he gets real personal. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. And he's talking to people in Israel who were good Jewish boys and girls back around 30 A.D. And he's still talking to us today about it. But that was their problem. They no longer worshipped idols. They worshipped money. That became their god. Dr. Oswald says, although people of the West in the 20th century have taken off the faces of the gods of love, security, potency, and power, we still surround them with trappings of great material value. And it's, it's, we have the same problem giving up money, giving up things, giving up status, giving up jobs, giving up all of that when God says to do so, just like the children of Israel had. If you were a Mormon growing up in Utah and you, gave your, and you give your life to Jesus Christ today, it could mean that your entire family will never talk to you again. If you're a Muslim growing up in the United States or in any other nation and you give your life to Jesus Christ, in some countries it means there's a death penalty now that you have to sustain. You will be killed. But in most places it simply means your family will never talk to you again. So... When, you, know, we, you, you stop and you think about that, there's a penalty that some people still pay today. They have to make a decision. What's more important? What is my God? Is Jesus my God? Is, is the Lord my Savior? Or do I need to maintain all these other relationships? Or do I main, need to maintain this job? Or do I need to maintain this? And I can go on and on and on and on. I'm not going to. What we see depicted here is that individual members of the nation at the end of the age, we'll throw away all their gods. They see Jesus in person, coming from the clouds, stepping on the Mount of Olives. The mountain splits in two, and the enemy is gone. They got rid of their false gods after Babylon. They did do that. But now they get rid of the money god and any other god that's in, it's in the way. It's out of there. There's nothing. And, it, and the scriptures here in verse 22 says, You will scatter them as an impure thing and say to them, Be gone. They will intentionally desecrate them. But here in verse 22, at the last part of the verse, when you look at the Hebrew, you really pick up the full revulsion that God has towards these false gods. And it becomes incredibly graphic. We have nice English words here, such as, you know, that, that you will scatter them as an impure thing. Okay, I get that. But here's what God's saying. The word scatter is the word tizre, which means to scatter, yeah, I got that. To sow, to winnow, to scatter bones, to spread dung. Oh. Okay. Impure thing. That word is dawa. And it, it's a thing, but it means a faint thing, a sick thing, a menstruating thing. So it's sick cloths. In other words, when somebody throws up, it's what they're throwing up into. Or it's used menstrual cloth. That's what they're talking about. And then where it says, be gone, the, world, the word is say, and it just means filth. It can also mean go out or come and go forth. But here's how it, it reads once you understand that. You will spread them out like dung. As you sick rags or used menstrual cloths and say to them, filth, be gone. Now we understand what God really thinks of false gods. It's true that some of us are introverts and some of us are extroverts. But did you know Jesus designed us to function best when we're part of a community? We all have God-given gifts and abilities that, when used rightly and in conjunction with others, the effect for the kingdom of God will be profound. It will reach many who are lost and hurting. So, listeners, if you don't have a community that you belong to, won't you consider getting connected with ours? or at least learning what we believe and why? TheUnsafeBible.com has all that information, and we'd encourage you to read what's written there and then spend some time in prayer. The Unsafe Bible is a radio ministry based out of Jupiter, Florida. 
And we're so glad that you've paused long enough to listen to today's message from Pastor Ken. If you like what you heard today and we've piqued your curiosity, why don't you satisfy it by checking out all the other messages we have for you? Go to the unsafebible.com and click on the media tab. That's the direct link to our archive. We trust that what you find there will challenge and grow your faith. While you're there, be sure to check out the other ways to stay connected with what's happening here at Calvary Chapel, Martin County. Would you rather enjoy connecting through social media? You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Pick your favorite platform or utilize all three. We trust that today's message from Isaiah spoke to your heart and challenged the parts of you that aren't looking like Jesus. Thanks for listening to The Unsafe Bible.